Hi everyone, uh, I can see that uh, the lobby is emptying and people are coming in so I'm going to get started. We've got a lot to get through today so we're going to get stuck right in um, but firstly just want to say thank you for coming. A uh, big warm welcome to you from, from the Cloud Essentials team. My name's Laura Hill. I head up Cloud Essentials across the, the UK region and uh, yeah, be your, your host today and I'll introduce uh, Chris Hathaway shortly as your presenter on information protection. So this is uh, first in a series of webinars that we're running over the coming months, really designed to help you uh, tap into powerful capabilities from Microsoft uh, around compliance and around reducing risk and around generally uh, really improving the way that you manage life cycle of content um, in Microsoft 365. And the reason we're running these sessions is because we see all too often organizations kind of getting a bit stuck in their journey to implement uh, technology around this area of information protection um, or maybe even kind of barely getting started or getting some some false starts uh, around this as a project which you know is, is a waste of of your your license and what you've invested in in terms of Microsoft 365 and we actually think a wasted opportunity as well to to use your Microsoft 365 environment as a, a kind of flagship platform in your journey as you you gradually mature compliance over unstructured data so our series covers lots of different topics, um, but kind of in response to this, the same symptoms that we see, um, which is that progress often gets stuck by firstly, a, uh, a sort of lack of basis around policy and business decisions really upon which you can then go forth and deploy technology. Um, secondly, a, a kind of lack of awareness of uh, regulation and, and the business requirements around compliance. Also a lack of awareness on actually the current state of play within the organization and the current levels of, of risk that content carries. And also a lack of awareness of the art of the possible really actually um, knowing what kind of capability that you can tap into and the, the technology that you can take advantage of. And thirdly, a, a lack of methodology to follow. So uh, a, a lack of kind of path pathway forward and, and logical stepping stones and a roadmap that's aligned with your your business requirements and, and best practices really that bring together people and process as well as the technology in order that um, it's a much more sustainable program. So today's session is around information protection and what you're going to experience today is a bit of a combination of, of theory um, but also demonstration uh, and diving into some of the Microsoft 365 capability and woven into that some sort of anecdotes from, from our experience that you can learn from. And the format that we're going to run with is uh, muted and mics off uh, for uh, the delivery of the presentation for about 30 minutes or so and then we're going to unmute and we're going to stop the recording and facilitate a an open forum so please bring your feedback bring your challenges to the table uh, bring your questions please use the the, the comments the chat um, to 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 bring any questions as we go through the content because we will then surface those at the end of the session. And yeah, I really hope that you can stick around for that second half. Um, we've got a, a vibrant mix of, of industries represented here today. Uh, we've got people from, from a legal firm, we've got education represented, we've got manufacturing and also a real mix of, of kind of roles on the call. So I can see that we've got some technical roles, uh, data privacy roles, more end user focused roles and certainly some we know have kind of been on this journey of, of um, information protection and others just sort of at the start. So uh, yeah, a real opportunity to engage in conversation with us, um, with with your peers and and also to engage with Microsoft directly. So um, our colleague Idayat Ibrahim from Microsoft is with us today as well as a, a cyber security and compliance black belt. So she'll be able to to bring some input there. So please take advantage of uh, of that second half. So just um, quickly for some context for those who don't know us already. Uh, and I suppose a bit of a backdrop so you understand where we're coming at this topic from. Cloud Essentials are a very active Microsoft partner and we, we exist to, to help organizations really mature their approach to managing content across the whole Microsoft 365 uh, as an ecosystem. So 
these are the kind of topics that you can talk to us about. And, you know, we're, we're all about sort of reducing your risk profile uh, within Microsoft 365 as you grow your content estate within it and, and helping you to preserve the right content in the right place and for the right amount of time and, you know, making that as cost efficient as possible to do so. And ultimately, sort of opening up the value that you have in content uh, within Microsoft 365 so you can really surface that um, to your business advantage. So we're going to be presenting a, a kind of series of sessions, as I mentioned, around uh, the very comprehensive uh, Microsoft, it's now called Purview stack over the coming months to impart some of our experience around it. So I hope that um, you'll get value from this session, but also join us for, for future sessions and kind of dip in and out of the series and, and also bring, you know, bring in your your risk and content based counterparts um, and you know your technology counterparts as well um, to, to explore these areas with us. So coming up, we're going to have a session on insider risk as well. We're going to have a session on compliance manager, which I know is Chris's favorite um, to to look at the to look at the interface around compliance manager together and really join up between IT and, and more compliance roles. And then we're really excited to host one on e-discovery as well with Adam Bown, who is a very experienced um, uh, specialist in, in technology and forensics. So he's going to walk us through the, the Microsoft stack around search and, uh, and discovery and then talk us through sort of how to really integrate that with much um, further downstream processing and e-discovery and uh, integrate that with outside counsel as well. So, so yeah, so look out for these, these sessions and, and resources from us. So before I hand over to Chris, I just wanted to say thank you for the input that you you brought prior to this session. Um, those who filled in that questionnaire or who've contacted us, it's really helped us shape this to, to what I hope will um, impart a lot of value and will be interesting kind of threads to pull on in that open forum session as well um, towards the end. And yeah, the feedback on the challenges that you have around these areas, uh, we found really interesting and they, and they certainly speak to the fact that getting this with, uh, sort of as an initiative off the ground and uh, sustaining labeling successfully is often more of a people process problem than, than sometimes a technology one, which is certainly um, our experience. So that message kind of resonated um, with our team. But yeah, really interesting to see the themes coming out here, which is, you know, knowing where the content even is, um, reliance on people and aligning departments around the process. There were themes there on building the business case around this, so to secure funding and get buy-in from a senior level. Um, but also, once maybe got labeling technology in, you know, the interaction that that technology has with the rest of the environment, plus um, tackling the rest of the environment as well outside of Microsoft 365 around labeling. Uh, and certainly one interesting one came up around this sort of shift in mindset. You know, once you've got that taxonomy in place and you're using labeling, uh, you know, baking that in to, to the design of any new applications and process as you, you move forward over time. So I'm going to hand over to um, Chris Hathaway, who's your presenter today. So you're going to benefit from his experience and his career around content management and compliance and uh, certainly being very hands on with the Microsoft feature set. Uh, and then I'll join you towards the end where we can um, facilitate this, this open forum and, and touch on some of these themes, as well as any questions that you fire at us as we go through the session. Chris. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, welcome to everybody who's joined. Hopefully we all get through the bulk of those questions in particular, and I'll, I'll try and focus on some of those areas. But as Laura, Laura mentioned, we will have some time for those questions and answers at the end. And, and we do have some other specialists and technical specialists, so we should be able to answer most things. So I think to get started, to, um, to get their work done, people in your organization collaborate with others, both inside and outside the organization. This means that content no longer stays within a network or behind a firewall. It can roam everywhere across devices, apps, and services, and that's just the norm in today. Um, 
And when it does run, you want to do so in a secure, protected way that meets your organization's business and compliance policies. Sensitivity labels from Microsoft Purview Information Protection let you classify and protect your organization's data while making sure that user productivity and the ability to collaborate isn't hindered uh, in ever more mobile and regulated world. So you kind of balance those mobile and regulation uh, sort of mobile requirements and regulation requirements against each other. <clears throat> so sensitivity labels in Microsoft 365 can help you take the right actions on the right content. With sensitivity labels, you can classify data across your organization and force that protection setting based on that classification. So before we get started, let's take a look at why we classify information and some of the critical success factors for your deployment program. Um, Laura mentioned a few of those already in, that, in, the, in those opening questions. So not all data is created equal and not all data should be protected in the same way. So there are three elements to a successful classification. The classification taxonomy or schema itself the protections that are associated with the data and how effectively organizations communicate its classification requirements through a change management process. <clears throat> so the classification taxonomy or schema is the list of levels that, that indicate the confidentiality of the organization's data. For example, highly confidential, confidential, internal or public. Data should be classified based on the risk of its loss or disclosure to the organization. This can often be a stumbling block as administrators wait for this information to become available so they can interpret the requirements into the technology. But we often find that a lot of this work has already been done in the various departments like HR and likely exists in various documents already. Although it is needed um, for the information to be pulled together, you, once it is pulled together, um, it can take effect in the technology in the appropriate way. Getting the buy-in from the most senior people in the business is critical and has in our experience been the number one reason for failed programs. Communication usually takes place by way of training, awareness programs and internal memos that need to carry the kind of authority that ensures the necessary attention needed for a successful information protection program, not only the deployment, but the actual use of that program once deployed. Once the labels exist, it's also important that the users associate that marking with the sensitivity required. And this also needs good communication and information about the labels themselves. How information is protected can depend on its location, format, and who needs to access it, including third parties. We can restrict access to specific users and groups through encryption, and some information may need to be kept for a certain period of, uh, or may need to be deleted more, uh, after a certain period, or for example, declared as a record. Here you would use the MS Purview data lifecycle management features, which we won't have time to cover today, but is also a critical element and building block of information protection and ultimately future e-discovery. Having some insight into the kinds of information that is processed by each business unit and how this is tied to the business unit's objectives, functions and processes is key to how the technology can be configured to protect the actual information and needs to be done through consultation with each of those business units. Here is the workflow we'll follow today. We'll be covering the steps a data protection officer would follow to create, define, and then publish an information protection label and policy. This will provide end users with the labels in the email and documents while the M365 platform will provide the technical restrictions to meet the privacy requirements. So where the so-called rubber hits the road. We'll also see that Microsoft Purview provides <clears throat> three ways um, of identifying items so they can be classified manually by the user, automated pattern recognition like sensitive information types, and what the one that excites me the most, the machine learning. 
So we'll look at why it matters, what it does, where to find it, what it looks like, and how to monitor it, how to monitor it. Uh, ultimately being probably one of the most important steps. There's no point in deploying these things unless you're monitoring and uh, taking advantage of the fact that they've been deployed and seeing that they're working effectively. As we mentioned, cuts buying data is essential to protecting it in accordance with the sensitivity and risk. Sensitivity labels within information protection are key to, achieve, are key to achieving this in a consistent and appropriate level of protection. Again, we do recommend that you define a classification taxonomy that is best suited to the specific, specific data process within your various departments in your organization before implementing sensitivity labels. Once the taxonomy is defined, sensitivity labels can be applied to the content, allowing you to define the specific protection settings that are applicable. Some of the options you have is to automatically include headers or footers or watermarks in those files to communicate to users the sensitivity level that the information has. You can also encrypt the content for highly confidential information and thereby determine the permissions that are available to both internal and external users wanting to access the content. When implementing the technology, um, you would first create the labels that will be automatically or manually applied to the content. We also recommend a default label be selected to set that base level of protection to all data. However, we do not recommend the default um, users any encryption as this can obviously become an unnecessary business interruption and particularly hamper productivity with external communications. When creating the label, you'll be able to define where you want the label to be used. If you select files and emails, you'll be able to configure encryption settings. If you select groups and sites, obviously you'll be able to configure the privacy access control and other settings for Teams, Microsoft 365 groups and SharePoint sites. You're also able to create sub-labels within sensitivity labels. And I know there were some questions around numbers of um, labels and, and how that works. We might speak to that a little bit more later. Um, note in this case, the parent label does not actually receive a protection setting, but is merely used to group similar um, sub-labels together. The parent label must be selected to view those sub-labels and remember that the order of labels is important as it shows priority. This is particularly important if you want users to provide a justification for changing a label to a less restrictive um, policy or label. And also if you use a recommended labeling and the content matches one or more policies, always the most restrictive label will apply based on this order. The most restrictive would always be the bottom of the list. Microsoft allows you to create a custom help page for your organization and link the URL to the sensitivity labels menu, which is really important for user adoption and demystifying the use of labels. Labels must be published to users and or groups to be available for use. And this is done through defining policies to be associated with those labels. So with regard to label policies, the order of the policies, like with the labels we just talked, spoke about, is also important. The policy is made up of the label, the users and groups to which the policy is available, protection settings of the policy. Once published, the drop-down menu um, of available labels is included in the Office apps, and clicking on the Learn More option is how the users will be directed to this customized help page. So um, we go into the Microsoft Purview Compliance Center, um, and this is the landing page for information protection, obviously by selecting the information protection submenu on the left. Um, we'll talk about how Azure, Azure Purview Catalog allows you to extend the application of sensitivity labels outside of Office 365 to data sources such as Azure Blob Storage, SQL Database, SAP HANA, and uh, even other cloud service providers like AWS a little later on in this session. 
sensitivity labels start with creating the label. You would then click give, uh, you would then click on the label name, uh, the display name, and description for users to provide more guidance when they view the, uh, and ensuring the correct consistent labeling is used, and the description for administrators, um, which they will see when monitoring the label in the security uh, and security or compliance centers in the dashboards. You would then need to define the scope, namely identify where you want the labels to be available. This can be in files and emails, as I mentioned, and you can also set sensitivity labels to apply to certain teams and Microsoft 365 groups and SharePoint sites. And note that to apply labels to teams, groups, and sites, you would need to first enable sensitivity support in Active Directory. If you're using Azure Purview Catalog to extend that labeling um, to uh, non-Office 365 data sources, you would click this here, and this, this feature is however currently available in preview, um, and you would also need to turn that off. But we'll chat a little bit more about that later. Now you set your protection settings. Choosing to encrypt the content allows you to determine who exactly will have access and the permissions associated with the labeled content. Choosing to mark the content will automatically insert headers and footers and watermarks to the content. And you have the option to remove any existing encryption that has already been applied to the content, or you can configure encryption settings which include specifying the permissions now or allowing the user to decide. You can then set your user access to content to expire. And you can also determine whether users can access content offline. If you select never or for a number of days, they must re-authenticate before being able to access the content again. You will then need to assign the permissions Select the users who can access the labeled content as well as their level of permissions. There are built in roles like co author, reviewer, and viewer, or you can select your own custom permissions. The next step is to select content marking, and your options are a watermark, header, or footer, and obviously you can set up your own custom text for these. In addition to customizing the text, you can also select things like font color and font size. If required, you can then set auto labeling for files and emails. If you've set up labeling for teams, groups, and SharePoint sites um, that have container level labeling, you would define the protection settings here. If you're setting up labeling for Azure assets using Azure Purview, um, you would set up auto labeling for the database columns here. You would then review your settings and save your label. At this stage, you can then publish the label or automatically apply it. Uh, we're going to publish the label. So first you need to select the label you wish to publish. There's the label we just created. Select the users and groups you want to be able to access the label. Um, remember, we're in the policy here. We've already set up the label. You have the option of all or select users or groups which will have access to this policy. <clears throat> you have the option to set this label as a default label. You can also allow users to provide a business justification for overriding the label or changing it to a lower classification. You can compel users to apply a label to the content, and you can also have the option to provide a link to a custom help page allowing those users to get more information on your labeling taxonomy and or other useful information that will just allow them to demystify the process and hopefully drive adoption. You then name your policy, and the last step is review your settings and save it. And your policy is created. So as I mentioned, 
it's really important to be able to monitor your policies once they're in place, your labels and policies. Um, and to monitor things, we select the data classification tab back into Azure, Azure Purview Compliance Center, and we go to the data classification tab. This overview tab on the data classification page is your central dashboard for monitoring all sensitivity labels, retention labels, DLP rule matches. And here you can get the insights into how sensitivity labels are being used, how many items contain each type, and an overview of the top classification activities. It's also where you can set up and view sensitive information types and tradable classifiers, which are used in the in the information protection labels themselves and policies that are that are subsequently um, applied. Um, you can drill down or follow through into um, a number of the visualizations showing sensitive information types um, that are most used or in your recent top sensitivity labels that have been applied. Um, locations where sensitivity labels are applied, uh, as well as um, <coughs> label or DLP rule matches and other compliance oriented activities. Um, perhaps just one more important um, area is this content um, explorer. If you drill down into um, the sensitivity label matches, or it'll actually allow you to drill all the way through into the actual content itself. And if we have a bit more time at the end, we may drill into that in, a, in another environment. Okay, so on to um, trainable classifiers. And trainable classifiers are another example of Microsoft's investments in machine learning coming to life in the M365 suite. Another example of this is uh, also using developments in Microsoft Syntax tooling to use specific content within a document for classification, but more on that in a future session. So rather than labeling content manually or by what it contains, for example, sensitive information types, um, this method of classification involves training the system to identify any content as belonging to a certain category of document. A classifier learns how to identify a type of content by looking at hundreds of examples of what you're interested in classifying. You start by feeding the system 50 to 500 examples that, are, that definitely fall within that category. You then test it, giving it a mix of both matching and non-matching examples. The classifier then makes the predictions as to whether these examples fall into the category you're building. You can then confirm its results, sorting out the true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives to help increase the ac um, accuracy of its predictions. Once published, the classifier sorts through items in locations like SharePoint Online, Exchange, and OneDrive, and classifies the contents. You can continue to train the classifier after publication by providing feedback on the accuracy until the accuracy reaches a level you're comfortable with, usually around 90 to 95%. Classifiers can also be used as a condition for auto-labeling with sensitivity labels and retention label policies, which is really useful. Examples we've had seen here and have had in the past include things like board minutes and board packs. The other good thing um, with trainable classifiers is there are several out of the box playbooks with classifiers already trained and ready for you to use. Resumes is just one category of files common to most organizations, which typically contain vast amounts of personal information that needs to be proactively managed. To train a classifier, you would click on the Create Trainable Classifier, enter your name and description. Um, to add data, you will choose the site or a pre-selected site, um, so you'll select the the location of the data you wish to use as the seed data, so the data that definitely is 
uh, in the classification you're looking for. Now you need to select the folders within that site um, that contains that seed data. Um, select the folder, review your settings, and the system will begin analyzing the seed content you've given it. It may take between one and two hours to process all the data. And then the next step, once the analytics have worked and you get the message, the analytics have, have, have completed and done their magic, <clears throat> you will then train the classifier to, to test it and improve its accuracy. Select your new classifier. Um, you'll note that the status reflects that it still needs test items. You would then add the items to test the classifier against in a more random sample set. Uh, choose the site where you have your data and the folder you created to train the classifier. Um, you can also add additional sites and folders with content that you want to use to test and train the classifier, provided they obviously don't contain any of that original seed data. You'll then see an overview of the classifier's predictions. In order to improve the classifier's ability to classify content, it is vital that you provide feedback regarding these predictions, namely whether they were a false positive, true positive, false negative, or true negative. You do this by selecting the tested items uh, to review, selecting the file, and then you can actually review the contents in the six in this Explorer uh, view over here and obviously confirm either way. And that will tell you whether the classifier correctly matched the item and then obviously select the relevant option and then you need to repeat this for all the test items. The accuracy will only update every 30 files from the reviewed. Click on analyze to see the the items reviewed and those awaiting review. After reviewing 200 items, you get a recommendation to publish. You'll note that the classifier's accuracy score here is at 89.4%. You can obviously continue to train the classifier until the score reaches a level appropriate to the category of data and the organization's risk tolerance. Again, we do recommend that you try and increase the score to above 90%. Right. Um, <clears throat> so earlier we saw a reference to the Azure Purview data map. And as mentioned, it is relatively new technology, technology offered by Microsoft and currently in preview. We have included it here as it aims to allow organizations to extend their view, control, and compliance capabilities to structured and unstructured data across a wider data landscape. In particular, structured data in database applications outside of Office to the Office 365 landscape. And this is something, you know, we've seen a lot of customers moving to Office 365 to take advantage of the security and compliance tooling. And this is really that next step in the process of allowing customers to really extend that adv those advantages into these other data landscapes. So Pervy Data Map can automatically discover and map a variety of data types in Azure, as well as some third-party repositories in AWS, on-premise data sources, and other SaaS data sources to help your organization catalog and understand the data. map also allows organizations to track and understand the lineage of their data across their estate. For example, where it originated, where it moved, how it was transformed, and what data derived from it. Users can search for data and set up scanning to search for keywords. Purview even makes recommendations and suggestions as you input your search queries. Selecting a result shows the operating metadata, such as its author, creation date, etc. Operational metadata within Purview Data Map includes any sensitive information types or sensitivity labels and where it is located in the file hierarchy. 
With Purview, data an analysts can open the data directly into Power BI to transform queries and create visualizations and extract that intelligence. So you would connect your data sources to data map using an ever-growing set of connectors. Purview then extracts technical and operational metadata as well as classification lineage. All metadata is then published to the Purview data map. Currently, uh, third-party data sources that Purview can connect to include, as, I, as we mentioned, Amazon S3, SAP HANA, and an ever-growing list as Microsoft continues its, its investment in the platform. As we saw in Office, the Office 365 Compliance Center, it is possible to extend your sensitive data and information protection policies. However, this functionality, again, is in, currently in preview, but I suspect it will be out of preview pretty soon. Okay, so I think that brings us um, to the end of our quick overview um, on or with a quick uh, information protection run through. I'm going to hand back over to Laura and potentially Johan if there are any specific technical questions, um, who, who is our expert in that field, um, and obviously for any other questions that may come up. Laura, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Did you want to talk to this slide a little bit further on those kind of three connecting elements? Um, um, were these three are connecting elements? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so yeah, um, I think what we've seen is, um, I guess in the in the in the starting here on the technology, that, which is probably the one we see most often. Um, the technology can help to provide business with more information about sensitive information, where it is, but it can't really help get you that taxonomy and get that taxonomy defined. And so often we find that the kind of the real stoppages in the process are um, related to waiting for that information to become available, but or we find that IT, the IT side of the business has just deployed a taxonomy, but it doesn't really mean much because you've deployed a bunch of labels, but where the rubber actually hits the road, they're not actually do, putting the necessary protections in place based on each business unit or the various business units, business requirements and security and risk requirements. So I'd say um, <clears throat> that certainly is one we see quite often. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so often we'll find people have started with the technology. Yes, the technology can help you get started, absolutely. But certainly from a tech, from a classification taxonomy perspective, you do need to go out, find the documentation that may already be available to your organization, such as in HR and various other departments where they may have this documentation in place, but it just hasn't been brought forward and actually put into the technology to where it can actually take effect. Um, sometimes you do need to go through a data classification taxonomy process. This is a non-technical process. We have specialists who will work with your various business departments and help them understand where and how to protect their sensitive information. And that is a critical part of those labels and the subsequent reporting on those labels being of any use and real function to the business. Um, the last three or the last of the three on communication, yes, absolutely. Probably the biggest failure we've seen is where we don't get buy-in from a senior enough place within the business. This hinders the progress of one even creating that uh, taxonomy in the first place by getting the buy-in from the various departments and business units to actually participate in the sessions so that the information that comes from those sessions can be deployed into the technology. Um, and two, making sure that when the communications around um, information protection go out, you know, everyone is going to pay attention and take uh, the necessary actions, whether they be manual or 
understand why they've been taken if they've been automated and not just get frustrated with the process. Sometimes we'll find, you know, um, people are sharing information externally and they're frustrated because the, the external parties can't access the information, but there's a reason for that. The information has been classified the way it's been classified for, for that reason. And again, you need the authority to carry the weight as to, you know, why that information isn't allowed to be shared externally, for example. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've got any to add to that, but those are just some of the, those that we do see regularly, um, Laura, but yeah, that's about all I can think of at the minute. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, and, that, you know, it resonated with the feedback that we had when we sent out the questionnaire, which was, uh, you know, that dependency on on people and um, bringing in the different stakeholders, but then that user communication piece and, uh, yeah, and having that taxonomy to begin with as that kind of peg that, that the technology hangs on. Uh, so, yeah, Chris, if you move us on to the, the next slide. Um, so that sort of wraps up uh, the presentation element. So hopefully you've come away with some insights from our experience around those kind of three areas of, of how to attack the project and familiarity with the features from Microsoft. Um, you know, so there's a bit more comfort maybe in navigating around them and the, the terminology.